Last time, I mentioned that analytical reasoning, computational skills, and physical knowledge are all critical components of an engineer's judgment. Building those skills starts with understanding how to model components of a physical system. Today, we are going to investigate how we model components of a mechanical system. In general, we use what are called constitutive laws to model individual components. These constitutive laws relate variables of interest, like position x and velocity v, the derivative of position with respect to time, to forces. For instance, a plot of a constitutive law might look like this one. On one axis, we have force. On the other axis, we have either position x or maybe velocity v. And the relationship between them is maybe a point like this. Now, engineered systems will typically be on some sort of line where if you decrease x, then that will decrease the force as well. But natural systems are typically not on a line. If you think of pulling on a spring like this slinky, this spring can only exert a force if it is either compressed or extended away from its natural length. So if the amount of extension is exactly zero, we expect the force to be zero. That's why this curve goes through the origin. If we pull on a spring, extending it to some set amount, then the amount of force we will feel will be non-zero and might be up and to the right, like up here. Now the thing to hope for is that if we draw a line between the origin and that point, we get a prediction of how much force we should feel for any given amount of extension of the spring. A relationship that has a line relating the two variables is called a linear relationship. A linear relationship is a lot to hope for, and in general, natural systems do not behave that way. But engineered systems have some engineer's brain involved, and that engineer's brain knows that we would prefer this to be a line. That's why engineered systems typically do end up with a constitutive law that can be described by a nice line like this one. By the way, that's also why this class is about modeling engineered systems. Only engineered systems, systems that have been designed by someone, actually behave this way. Mechanical diagrams play a critical role in how we set up models of mechanical systems. And in this class, we are going to always assume that we have three types of components, springs, dampers, and masses. We will always use these three symbols to represent the three types of idealized components. First, we have a spring. Second, we have a damper. And lastly, we have mass. Whenever a spring, like this slinky, is an extension, its position x is defined to be positive. Whenever a damper, like this syringe, is extending, its velocity is defined to be positive. Moreover, the relationship between force and position of a spring is always a line represented by the constitutive law f sub s is equal to k times x sub s, where the positive number k is called the spring constant. The relationship between force and velocity of a damper is also always a line represented by the constitutive law f sub d is equal to b times v sub d, where the positive number b is called the damping constant. Hence, the force on a spring being positive implies that the position must be positive. And the force on a damper being positive implies that the velocity of the damper must be positive. With these sign conventions in mind, we can combine elements into combinations of elements. So for instance, if I have a wall and a spring and a damper that's in parallel with that spring, and an external force that's pulling on both of them, I have two elements that are in parallel and a force. Note that the spring and damper, both connected to the wall on the left, must move in unison. The only allowed motion is horizontal motion. No matter how many elements are in parallel with each other, they must move just to the left or to the right. They cannot move up and down in the diagram. That implies that the end of the spring is attached to the end of the damper, which implies a relationship between the position of the spring, x sub s, and the velocity of the damper, v sub d. In particular, the time derivative of the position of the spring must be equal to the velocity of the damper. Lastly, you should know that we always define positive acceleration of a mass to be to the right 
and external forces are always positive if the force is acting to the right. That is, the force would cause a positive acceleration of a mass. Now, sometimes our understanding of a physical system will not be well aligned with our understanding of idealized elements. As an example, consider this very simple system. Again, we have a wall and a spring and an external force acting on that spring. There's no mass in this system. When the spring is an extension, the force is defined to be positive. And when the external force is positive, it is pulling the spring into extension. What does our constitutive law say about what happens if F external starts out zero and then suddenly becomes positive? Specifically, what if F external equals zero newtons until T equals one and then becomes F external equal to one newton? While the external force is zero, the force on the spring is zero and its position is zero. Hopefully this makes sense because the spring will only be extended or compressed if something is forcing it to be. However, if we make the force jump up to one newton, the position of the spring will instantaneously jump as well. That probably seems unintuitive, but that's because real springs have ideal spring properties plus damping properties and mass properties. Keeping in mind the difference between these idealized elements and the real physical objects they represent is one of the key skills you will develop over the course of this class, because this difference forces us to bridge the gap between analytical reasoning and physical knowledge. So what should you remember from today? Keep in mind that constitutive laws are linear because we engineer systems to make them linear, that sign conventions matter, and that idealized mechanical elements can have very unintuitive behavior.